So I guess, Rebecca, um, we know from ASEAN and APEC um, that not everything in international economic exchange can or should be negotiated. Um, you know, there's a lot of it's building trust, building confidence, um, and importantly, that's between countries, but also between leaders towards consensus. And, and that's been important in APEC and, and you touched on that. I, I guess what I'm interested in is, is that era over now with China-US strategic rivalry? How has that affected APEC? Um, you know, we didn't have a, a leader statement in 2018 in Papua New Guinea. Um, Alaska doesn't fill us with so much confidence and hope. Uh, we woke up to news here um, that there has been an exchange of sanctions between the United States, Europe, Canada, the UK, and China. Um, I understand at the working level um, in APEC, there's a lot of progress here on capacity building, technical cooperation, but without the leaders level, I just wonder um, what the prospects are and how you navigate that. Um, and then to Deborah after that, um, I think your slides showed the difference in generations of, of those agreements, the TPP, the DEPA, and then the Digital Economy Agreement. Um, I guess the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, the Singapore, New Zealand, Chile Agreement, looks a bit like the P4 in intent, the P4 that led to the Trans-Pacific Partnership with Brunei, of course, involved. It's designed to expand membership. Um, well, I guess, what are the prospects of, of expanding membership with that? And, a key question there is why didn't Australia join the DEPA and instead negotiate a, a bilateral with, with Singapore? Um, you know, does this imply the larger the, the membership, the harder it is to make progress? Or is this simply a function of um, the more modern agreements uh, having more to them? So um, to you, Rebecca, first and then to Deborah, yeah. thanks. Thanks. You know, th this question keeps coming up. Um, you know, there was no statement in, in 20 in 2018, no leaders meeting 2019, but we had a very successful 2020 despite COVID. And uh, so that, that sort of uh, sets the scene. So there was clear agreement among economies that we need to, in this, especially in this time of, of COVID and in times of crisis, you need to pull together rather than go it alone. And you know that the, the clear message that came out was we cannot go it alone. Having said that, I, I want to go back to Peter's uh, thing about a mouth, was it Peter or was it, was it uh, Josh? I can't remember. Multi stakeholder, where you talk about uh, it's not about just the government folks working on policy, but bringing in the private sector. And this is where, you know, in spite of all the talk of the tensions, it's really at the end of the day that, that conversation that we have with the private sector, with the APEC Business Advisory Council, that really makes a difference in the conversation um, you know if it's and then I, I always say that APAC is not political yes you get geopolitics casting a shadow on the conversations that are going on but because you have a very strong um, relationship and an engagement with the private sector that makes a lot of difference and the the non-binding nature also allows for a more free flow kind of thing when you have a bilateral negotiation as what happened in alaska that the posturing is different you're also playing to your audience whether it's the media whether you're trying to reach a bit broader audience but in in apac it is really about a non uh, a more candid conversation with without that that string attached as it were so that's that makes a difference and that makes me very optimistic of, of the conversations that we're having in APAC in this area, in spite of the, the, the noise that's going on outside the room, you know? Yeah. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Deborah. Thank you, some good questions. So let me just talk about DEPA for a minute. So the idea behind DEPA, I think, was let's do a P4. In other words, let's take some ideas that we know are important, that we know we have alignment on and start to create a framework that will allow others to dock on to DEPA. And I think, the, so I, I get where the idea came from um, and it makes a lot of sense in, in that respect. It's taken longer than I think the original DEPA countries thought to get more countries interested. So it's been several years since we announced DEPA and Canada is the first one to say, I'd like to join that as well. They are all still CPTPP member countries. So many of the CPTPP member countries would say, well, what do I need DEPA for? I already have really in some ways the highest standards embedded in the CPTPP. What do I want to have a less binding 
more cooperative kind of modular approach agreement between us for? Like, what's the point of that? We already have gone beyond it in many respects. And what's not in CPTPP, but in DEPA is mostly this cooperation commitments. We'll have conversations about lots of things. And, and I, so that's, I think, why you don't have more countries signing on to DEPA who are in the CPTPP, like in Australia, where they look at that and they go, actually, that's too light for us. And we would have difficulties justifying signing that potentially domestically, because we have to get it through parliament, perhaps, or not, or explain why it's not in parliament. So it's just a challenge sort of domestically. I think what DEPA is designed to do, again, makes a lot of sense to me. It says, let's take a bunch of modules and then let's get countries to decide how do they implement those modules? How do they expand them in some areas? How do they take a module from DEPA and slot it into some other agreement? And if we did that, the idea was, will we just be sort of seeding the general principles into lots of different venues in ways that are consistent? So the idea makes sense to me. The challenge is the execution, which is that DEPA on its own is really quite thin. And it's too thin, ironically in some ways, too thin for the members who are currently in it, who are much more ambitious, uh, most of them, uh, particularly like a Singapore, New Zealand, very enthusiastic and ambitious, doing much more than just DEPA. And the countries that you need DEPA for, which are those that are nervous about digital trade commitments, not certain where their regulatory environment will be, are less likely to join DEPA as well. And so you kind of haven't solved the problem of trying to get ambitious countries to stay ambitious, but also bring in the sort of reluctant players to participate in something. And so I think DEPA, although I, again, I'm sort of, I, I get the idea behind it and it makes a lot of sense. I don't think it's, it's solving the challenge that it was intended to do. So how do we get that? Just as a last question challenging. You're going to have to, if you really wanted this to work, you would have to do a much better sales job on it. And you would have to be bringing along sort of recalcitrant members to say, either join DEPA, or can we talk about how we build out those modules? And can we create like mini DEPAs, like on a particular set of modules, perhaps? But then again, what are we ultimately doing? And this is where my concern is with DEPA. We're still fragmenting. So you can say we're using consistency, but the consistency is so thin as to be not particularly helpful uh, in many of the modules. And so I think at the end of the day, again, I get where the idea came from. It makes a lot of sense to me, but I think it's just practically speaking, how does it really make a difference? I'm still a bit on the fence, which is why I think you haven't seen DEPA expand as much as it might have. If it were a much more, um, if there were more compelling reasons either to get advanced economies, advanced digital economies in or to get the less advanced digital economies to participate. So that, that gap is still not closed. Thanks, Deborah. That, that leads me to a question for Josh on this like-minded countries, a group of like-minded to, to make progress. And I think a few people have mentioned this and, and you had this in your slides too. I'm gonna make sense to build trust and make progress where you can. Um, you know, I've seen other proposals where you work with democracies um, I guess my question is, how can these groups be defined? And, and you had a list there, but you immediately qualified that. Um, how can these groups be more inclusive? Um, because I think depending on the issue, you're going to have different groups of countries that are different like-minded groups, really. Um, you know, included India in the list, but not China, of course. Um, and that might seem obvious from some perspective. Um, but I think China has, has signed on to the DFFT, the Japanese Data Free Flow of Trust, um, um, and was, I, I think, um, a more constructive player in RCEP, whereas India has backed away from both of those. So, of course, Indonesia is not included in a lot of these lists, even lists of countries with um, of like-minded democracies. So I just um, I want to tease you out there on, on what you think, um, how we can have these sort of flexible groups around issues, or do you think you need to have core groups making progress and have others join. Um, and then to Peter, um, who, you know, you mentioned co-regulation is important to establish alignment. Um, and, and I'm just trying to think this through um, and, and just bear with me for a second, but I want to tease you out on, on or ask you about foreign ownership of data assets in other countries. Um, is, it a, a, is it possible to come to agreement on data protection, um, that's how it's protected, how it's used, audited, accessed by government. Um, are we able to have agreement, do you think, or is this just gonna be a, a case of 
each country going their own way and perhaps the United States setting a, a standard, say through the standards and, and restrictions they put on TikTok or proposed on TikTok. Um, and we're not going to have any harmonization. We'll just, um, some countries will follow the United States. Everyone else will have different regulations. So your, your co-regulation for alignment, um, I just want to tease you out on that. So uh, to you first, Josh. Um, okay, thanks, um, Shiro. So I, I, let, me, let me actually just start by um, quoting from the, um, the interim, the United States Interim National Security Strategic Guidance Document, which is from March 2021. And, um, you, you know, the, one, one of the things I think that jumps out at you when you read that document, this is the, um, the third paragraph in the introduction, it says, um, you know, talking about values and, and, and working with allies, it says that begins with the revitalization of our most fundamental advantage, our democracy. Um, and so, and, and, and on it goes. And, you know, I, I read that because I, I think what we're going to see for the United States is, is, is this notion of defending democracy, defending democracies as an increasingly sort of central foreign policy and, and national security sort of, you know, leap motive and, and, and driving aim for this administration. And that's going to, I think, play out in, in a whole range of different ways. In, in this space, in the technology slash trade world, um, it, it is going to mean that I think the administration is going to look where, where it looks to talk about allies and build new avenues for cooperation. It will be centred around like-minded um, or, 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 or sort of essentially democracies. And so that's um, in part the reason why China is is absolutely not in that group, um, and 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 while they're, they're, and, and it's it, it's going to be this is going to be hard to do because let's not get into the discussion of who's democratic and who's not, but 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 that's where the administration is. Um, so that's my first point. Um, the th second point on China, I think, is that. The, the approach that I think will, 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 will evolve, and again, if you, you get this from, from multiple statements, again, from the administration, is this notion of essentially coming to China with strength, um, which is really going to be predicated on, on building out um, common positions and cooperations amongst democratic allies um, as, as a starting point. The idea that you sort of it's begin a negotiation around a data governance framework with China, I think, is an absolute non-starter for this administration. And so it, it is um, doing that work beforehand um, and developing sufficiently ambitious principles, which is really key here. Um, and then either China does or doesn't get involved and, th and there's there's ways we can talk about what that means, but that was that's not that new, right? I mean, the TPP to some extent was about creating norms that China may or may not have had to respond to, but you know, building out these norms amongst like-minders is, is not that different, but I think it, it is certainly where the administration is going to be going. Um, on your variable sort of geography, different groups, small groups, so that exists already. The um, slide that I put up with all the, you know, there's seven or eight, nine different groups, G7, G20, international standards, OECD, APAC, GPI, um, and so forth have got multiple different um, combinations. Some of them include China, right? So China is very active in international standards bodies. China obviously participates in the G20 or point about DFFT. So there are already avenues in fact for, for leaders level engagement with China. Um, so I think we've got the multiple variable geometry with the different groupings. And I think that's a strength at one level. I mean, one, one can see that as confusing and, and disorganized, but. I think given the range of issues that are being discussed, the different equities at stake, working through these organizations, these multiple forums as they already exist, is going to be part of the picture. Um, but what is going to be needed to give effect to this notion of coordination, democracies getting onto the same page and building out cooperation gets you to this idea of a leaders level coordinating body. Peter? Thanks, Shira. They're good questions. Um, let me pick up on two things and I'm going to try and answer the questions as I recall them directly. Uh, the first is Josh's terribly depressing comment that given the administration's idiosyncrasies that the data governance, a data governance regime for the administration, a data governance regime with China is a non-starter. 
that's um, that's terribly depressing and just wrong-headed to start off with. But it's interesting the way Josh defines it. You're talking about non-digital issues, which I think is part of the problem. You're talking security and you're talking democracy and so on. These aren't digital issues per se. This is coming into... So we're, we're jumping the concept of digital rules of the road before we've even started and saying it's a non-starter. And I think that's, that's something we need to recognise. The other issue is your question to Deborah about DAPA, DAPA um, and, and Deborah's comment that it's, it's, in her opinion, too thin, which I would echo. Part of the issue of why you're not getting take-up is no one's actually made clear what the benefits are. I mean, again, these trade agreements right now aren't terribly digital. They're trade. And we've got some digital challenges that no one is really addressing. In fact, in most of the current trade agreements, we're reinforcing the problems with digital, not addressing the issues with digital. And so those rules of the road aren't emerging. And that sort of leads me to your questions that you levelled at me. The, the issues around data protection and ownership of foreign ownership of data assets, if I heard it correctly. We got a problem there in that we don't know what data ownership and data assets actually are. As we move from free flow of data that keeps getting invoked here to data sharing agreements, where you are talking about multiple processing of data and the reaccess and the reuse of data, which is where we are going. That's a given. And then I'll get to your co-regulation because if that's the environment in which you are moving to, how do you identify those data assets as they get processed, reprocessed, shared, reshared, redistributed, and so on? Now, there are technical solutions to that, and they're actually fairly common and they're coming to the fore. We then need the, the contractual agreements that come into place around these issues, and then we need the rules of the road, and then we need the regulatory enforcement and accountability. That's a fairly standard step-up procedure. Right now, we're coming at that the other way and trying to do all of this in a tiny amount of time where we've had years and years to do that in the past. And that's probably your biggest challenge of all. On the data protection, can we have that commonly? Of course we can. That's an issue of different jurisdictions talking to each other. One of the things that I'm encouraging Rebecca, as she knows, to re-import into APEC, because we started this in APEC at the start of the roadmap process, was the idea of data transfer mechanisms, which ASEAN has made some headway on. Taking data trans, which needs to be reworked, they're in very nascent, um, um, clunky form right now, but data transfer mechanisms that allow existing data protection, of which we have an emerging number, to be able to talk to each other. There's nothing terribly conflictual or confusing about that, except right now they're being defined not on digital terms. I'll pause there. Can I just come in quickly, um, just a, a, a very quick response, because um, Peter always raises <laughs> the hardest and most interesting questions at times. I just want to just clarify, really, um, when it comes to China, my, my point, just so I was clear, was not that the US will not be engaging with China. They will bilaterally. We saw that in Anchorage and in the G20. It's just that the, the this, this coordinating group and getting to ambition on, on digital doesn't begin with China. Also, I think I just want to come just like a couple of points on, on that this is a too broad an agenda. I mean, I think from my perspective now, digital is about security. I mean, there is really no, no, no light between those two issues um, on, on a range of, of, of factors here. And it is about democracy. Um, I mean, one of the areas we, I spend a lot of time in now is, is artificial intelligence and how artificial intelligence gets regulated is, is going to be deeply value driven and technology is already value driven, right? Like the, the approach China takes to privacy is different to the approach Europe takes to privacy is different to the approach the United States takes to privacy. So this is challenging because even amongst democracies, there are different values and approaches to these issues. But it, it, is, as, it is as close to a common set of foundational principles that we have that can inform how values infuse technology, which is going to be a core part of this. Thanks, Josh. We're, we're rapidly running out of time for this panel before we go to the concluding session. And I, I recognize Rebecca's going to be on the concluding session. So um, maybe I'll just pitch to Deborah, Josh and Peter very quick responses on some very big questions. Um, we've had a number of questions from the audience around the like-minded group, and I think we've covered that a, a fair bit between Josh and, and Peter uh, and Eva and Deborah. But um, one question is about um, the discussions today showing bottom-up efforts, um, they count and they're very important, but what about top-down efforts from the G7, G20? Um, 
Um, what are your views on that? And then um, I want to come back to Ambassador Bilahari's question on, you know, the big system differences between China and the United States, and hence the pessimism that was sort of turned over to a bit of optimism later on. You know, Wendy did um, mention um, and emphasize China's sovereignty. Um, you know, there's a core, uh, I think that ch this is not an issue that's confined to China um, and, and countries will continue to regulate um, based on their values and interests domestically. Um, I guess for me, the WTO and earlier the GATT um, is an example of, of working with different systems um, and keeping those key principles of you know, being able to regulate your own economy, where, where is bringing some rules and some understanding that bring transparency, predictability, and some constraints, limiting dis discrimination. I guess the question would be, um, can that kind of approach be the right approach for digital governance as well? So I won't get you all to answer both questions, but anyone who want to jump in on either of those questions, Deborah, Joshua, or Peter. Um, well, I'll just say that I think, you know, if digital ends up being the economy, then we clearly are going to need to have cooperation and it's going to need to take place like the GATT WTO system over time and with different groupings as it expands out and evolves. But I think there are all kinds of challenges that are different that need to be addressed. Some of them are technical and practical and can be resorted out, I think, even between competing systems relatively easily, and some of them are much harder and much deeper to deal with. But but one key point, one that I think is essential, is you have got to involve the private sector and we have got to do a much better job of educating governments, government officials, on the digital economy. Because we are still talking about people who literally look out the window and say, I don't understand how my data is in that cloud. You know, And if that's the folks who are regulating our digital economy, we're in trouble. So I think above all we need, and I guess this sort of echoes Peter's point, we really need to have more conversations about what is the digital economy? What does it do? What is it not currently doing? What can it do? How do we think about the future? So that we have some base knowledge before we get deep in the weeds around regulations and around policy responses, trade agreements, whatever it might be, whether it's top down or bottom up is kind of irrelevant in that sense. As long as we start building out capacity by the officials who are making decisions to understand the problems, the challenges, the issues and the opportunities, we're just gonna end up with an unholy mess. And so I, I think this is kind of session that we're having this morning. I mean, I don't know who's the audience. I hope that there are people that matter um, are paying attention to some of the ways in which this is getting defined um, in order for them to level up their own knowledge to be able to tackle this more effectively. Thanks, Deborah. Josh? Um, no, I, so I, I, you know, I think I absolutely second um, Deborah's, Deborah's emphasis and point. I think, look, let me just, I mean, for for sake of repetition, uh, to some extent, um, uh, look, the G20 and, and the G7 remain um, certainly important and will continue to be so. I mean, I mean in, in some respects, it will be one of the core forum for engaging not only China, but but Russia and, and, and others. Um, you know, what Italy, I mean, you, you know, it, it's a bit variable, right? I mean, it, it, Italy's got a, a digital agenda from what I can make of it, but it's, it, you know, it, there is something about the the agenda setting around digital and and the the way that leaders prioritize it which i think limits its effectiveness over time to some extent um it's a bit too idiosyncratic um but there's nothing that can be probably done about that and you know the membership is what it is i mean there are opportunities there but it's not the key steering committee for for digital and can't be g7 more like-minded but but actually too small too european um, focus to European heavy, um, you know, does include, um, you know, other significant digital players that really need to be part of that. So we don't have the perfect forum, but we have, we, we work with what we've got, you know, that's, we, we need to be pragmatic in that respect. Um, and so, you know, I think again, another, another area where we need to drive more ambition and use that as, as a place where we can sort of you know, essentially caucus um, around very ambitious sort of proposals, which can then be seeded in other, in other places. Thanks, Josh. And finally, Peter. Uh, Ambassador Bilahari, I'm a huge, as he knows, I'm a huge fan and follower of um, 
he, uh, he, he nailed it in part with this issue that we're dancing around of China is both, and I'll misquote, the problem, the, the problem and, and the solution. Um, they're intrinsic to both, and they're driving a lot of this. To, to Josh's point of, and I, I actually agree, that, that the Biden administration is going to struggle to uh, engage on a digital governance uh, regime. That to some extent, that's a non-starter when it's defined in these other terms. Is probably it's not defined that way for China. There's a commercial aspect which is just crucial, and I think that was mapped out quite comprehensively. Um, the reason I pick up on Ambassador Bilahari is to echo Deborah's point around awareness. We are now past the age where any senior official ought to be saying, I'm not tech savvy, I'm not digitally savvy. Ambassador Bilahari is one of the most digitally savvy people I know. In the same way that we need people to be at that level, not saying they can't talk financial. When we're talking about economic development, we don't have any of our senior officials saying, I'm going to give you some thoughts, but I don't understand finance. The digital agenda, as Deborah keeps saying, is the economy. It is the overall governance. So we need to, and he, he nailed it. So we need to stop that position. We need to start addressing some of these issues looking forward, both for the governance regime you want to create and these trade agreements instead of looking backwards in the rear view mirror. We need to address some of these digital challenges on their own terms. Otherwise, they're going to keep coming up. And APEC is probably the prime place for taking some of these forwards because it's non-binding, because we can actually bring people to have the conversations and recognise that we're all going to be different, but we're going to have this public-private intermixing of the technical savviness and the rules of the road that allow us to participate at scale and at, at speed. Fantastic. Thanks, Peter. That's a, a nice way to wrap up this panel.